I'm really delighted to be here for this Art Plus Wellness program. And, whoops, I need to turn it on. There we go. Oh. Uh, so last month, you had Gary Glazner here, over there. And that's a picture of Gary, but that's a picture that Gary posted on Facebook. Gary's a good friend of mine. He, he was actually at our house for dinner on Saturday night. Um, and, um, and I know he was here in April. Uh, and uh, that picture on the right is a picture of Gary at memory camp. I'm going to show you another picture from memory camp in a little while. Uh, memory camp is another program that my husband and I started. Uh, it's a three night, two full day residential camp experience for people living with some type of dementia and their families. And we are at this gorgeous camp in northern Wisconsin, in St. Germain, up by Eagle River, if you know that area. And um, we just uh, spend this time together enjoying the natural beauty of the place and um, leaving the diagnosis at the top of the hill, we like to say. So, we're just there together. We've had people ages five to 95 at memory camp because people sometimes bring grandchildren and adult children. Um, so feel free to be in touch with me if you'd like to hear more about memory camp. But Gary is our poet in residence at memory camp. <laughs> and um, as some of you experienced last month, it's a lot of fun. So I uh, just wanted you to know about that. Now, uh, as I told you, Gary posted on Facebook um, the poem that you all wrote last month. And this is the last line of the poem. Oops. It, it was a poem about bears. And your last line was, the bears teach us to find common ground. So I don't know if any of you are here that maybe provided that last line. Aha! <laughs> uh, but I just, I was very moved by that. So I'm about to show you a quote from a British poet named John Killick, who writes a lot about various types of dementia. And I just want us to take a little bit of time to think about this quote. It is a supreme irony that those whose personhood we have had the temerity, the nerve, to question may be the very persons to teach us to see our own personhood in a fresh light and to lead us to reevaluate human possibility. That means that working with folks with some kind of cognitive disability may enable those of us who don't yet have that cognitive disability to see ourselves in a new light. In other words, referring back to the poem that you all wrote last month, in other words, people with dementia can help us to find common ground. So thank you those of you who were here last month for providing that wonderful idea. So, here's what I want to do today. I want to work through a couple of topics. I want to start by saying, why do we need these community arts programs? Why do we need things like SPARK? Things like this Art Plus Wellness program? And then I'm going to focus on museum programs because well, we're in a museum, uh, so I want to focus on that, but then I want to give you a little bit of research nerdiness, okay? So, you know, that's who I am. I'm a research nerd, and, and so I'll just give you a little bit to demonstrate to you that scientists are able to show that participation in programs like this is good for us. Art plus wellness. That's not just something that's made up, right? 
that's something that has some evidence behind it. So allow me to be a little nerdy for just a couple minutes. Uh, and then I want to show you some other types of community arts programs uh, for people living with some type of dementia because they're spreading. Uh, and then I want to talk about next steps and the next steps connect to network health. So here we go. All right, so why do we need these programs? Well, I'm, gonna about, I'm about to show you one of my all-time favorite slides. This is our state of Wisconsin. And this uh, comes from the Department of Health Services in Madison. And it shows population change in Wisconsin over the course of 20 years. Not much time. Between 2015 and 2035. And this very dark blue represents counties that by 2035 will have between 27 and 43 percent people 65 and older. Okay? You and I were just talking about Michigan. Look what happens to the state of Wisconsin over the course of 20 years. We are aging, and we are moving into the dark blue, okay? And do you know the most common reason for the development of dementia? What is the biggest risk factor for the development of some type of dementia? Age. Age, okay? So why do we need these community art programs? Here's a good example. Keep this in mind. I'll return to this later. Yes? And not learning something new every day. Uh-huh. Yep. Yeah, we need to learn something new every day. Hopefully, I'll tell you something new today. <laughs> so, OK. So why do we need these uh, programs? Well, let me give you another reason why we need these programs. And it's interesting, I was listening to uh, the news as I drove down today, and I was um, hearing a report uh, from the Surgeon General of the United States who has written a book about loneliness. And, and the word is getting out about how loneliness affects us both our physical and our mental health. So this is some work that was done uh, a little over 10 years ago by the Eden Alternative. It's an uh, organization that um, uh, brings a new way of thinking to long-term care. And they noted that the biggest problems for many older people, especially those living with a type of dementia, biggest problems, loneliness, Boredom and helplessness. Loneliness, boredom, and helplessness. And here today, I'm driving down to West Bend from Appleton, and I'm listening to the radio, and they're talking about loneliness. Okay? So what do we do about this? Well, this is another reason why we need these community arts programs. For loneliness, we need community connections. Like this like having you here today. And what do we do about the boredom? We need some kind of meaningful activities, something that really engages us, not the same old thing day after day. Is this Tuesday or is this Wednesday? You remember the pandemic, right? <laughs> when we weren't sure what day it was. All right. And what do we do about the helplessness? Well, we emphasize what people can do for themselves and, importantly, <coughs> what they can do for others. Yes? Um, if, you, if somebody if elderly is boring, maybe more to a group? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. We need each other, right? Those community yeah. connections. Really awesome. So we can, we can solve the loneliness, the boredom, and the helplessness with programs like this. And, and this last point, emphasizing what people can do for themselves and for others. 
It's very um, upsetting to me to know that I have in my office fat folders full of research articles that show how much good it does for people to volunteer. Okay, there's a whole bunch of research out there about volunteerism. It's good for our mental health and our physical health. Lots of science behind that. And yet, when a person gets a diagnosis of some type of dementia, all of a sudden we assume, well, they can't do anything anymore, right? We have to do stuff for them. And we take away that opportunity for them to help others. And I'm talking about people in the community, and I'm also talking about people in long-term care. People in long-term care can help other people. And I have lots of stories about that, but I won't go into them now. Okay, so why do we need these programs? Because we want to address the loneliness, the boredom, and the helplessness. So this is a sign that um, I took a picture of back in 2008. I was up in Vancouver uh, for a conference and I just, I love this. It was a windy day, so I couldn't get it really clear. But look what the last uh, line says in yellow. Art speaks when words fade. I love that. Art speaks when words fade. Another reason why we're all here. So, the Spark Alliance, hooray for the Spark Alliance. We are so fortunate to have the Spark Alliance in Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Iowa, Colorado. Um, it is spreading, and, and, but it started here, okay? And it started here in 2010, and the Museum of Wisconsin Art was part of that first group of arts organizations to be in the Spark Alliance. And since then it has grown, they have annual conferences, well, except for the pandemic, um, but um, uh, really trying to spread the word about uh, how art can speak. When words fade, when memory is kind of causing us some problems, when life seems to have changed, and when we're lonely, bored, and feeling helpless, art can speak, and then we speak with each other. <clears throat> and that's what Spark is all about. So uh, if you've never gone online to check out the uh, uh, website for the Spark programs, do that. There's a, there's a wonderful video online about the Spark programs, and, you can poke around and see the SPARK programs at different arts and cultural institutions um, um, wherever they are. Uh, so uh, check it out. So here's a picture um, from up in uh, uh, Appleton. Uh, the person with the rolled up sleeves in the back is uh, Oliver Zornow, who's been involved with SPARK for a long time. Um, Spark generally in art museums involves art making and art looking and, 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 and telling stories about art. So this is an art making group up in Appleton. And this is an art looking and art storytelling group. And some of you have probably experienced something like that if you've attended SPARK programs. And you know that we're not at a SPARK program to give you a lecture on Van Gogh, right? You know, we're not going to do that. We're going to look at a painting or a sculpture or something on the wall, and, and we're going to say, hmm, what do you suppose is going on here? Just like you made that story up about the bear, right? Okay. What's happening here? What do you hear? What do you smell? Where's that bear going next? We use our imagination in these programs, and it's wonderful because 
When you have some type of dementia, you do not lose your ability to have imagination. You might forget details about things, information, but you still have imagination, and that's what we employ with SPARK programs. So I want to show you something very special that happened to me uh, last, not last month, in March. We're in May already. Um, so I had the great uh, honor uh, and, and lots of fun of spending a week in Florence uh, in March. And um, we were there with uh, our family, my husband, uh, son, daughter-in-law, other daughter, two grandchildren ages 11 and 13. It was just a, a week to remember forever. But I was able to connect with a wonderful man who works uh, with a museum in Florence with a spark-like program. And he came to Milwaukee a few years ago to learn about spark and take it back to Tuscany, okay? Uh, and, and so in Tuscany, which you know is a region of Italy, they have over 60 museums in one area of Italy that are doing spark-like programs spread over, and then they have 20, more than 20 organizations that are kind of pulling these programs together. And um, you can go online and poke around and see what they're doing in Tuscany alone. They are doing these programs. And why do they need to do this? Well, you may have heard this. This is data from uh, the World Economic Forum this year, but it's uh, 2022 data. Italy is the second oldest country in the world, behind Japan. Italy. So this lists the world's oldest populations. Almost one quarter of all people in Italy are 65 and older. Okay? And they've responded by establishing these arts programs. Okay, so. Here we are at the Palazzo Strozzi. This is where, uh, what's that? I was there in March. Too. You were there in March too? At the same time. Oh my yeah. goodness. <laughs> well, um, it, it is uh, not quite like the Museum of Wisconsin Art. <laughs> it was, uh, construction began in 1489, okay? But it is a contemporary art museum and it has a spark-like program. And my husband and I were just incredibly honored to be able to attend this program. And here's a picture from that day. Uh, this is the man sitting on the floor here, Luca Carli Berloli, who is the person who came to Milwaukee to learn about our spark programs and take it back to Italy. Uh, and uh, they're doing what we do in Spark. These are folks living with some type of dementia. They're sitting in front of these three paintings by a Ghanaian artist. And um, my husband and I couldn't understand a word they were saying <laughs> because, of course, they were speaking Italian and we don't speak Italian. But we could feel the room. That's cool. Okay, we could feel the engagement of the room. And this just shows a small portion of the people who were there. But they were doing it like a time slips program of asking those imaginative questions. And you can see Luca is very intent. He's got a pencil in his hand and he's writing down everything people say. Just like Gary last month, right? He whips out his notebook and he writes things down. Well, this is happening in Florence, okay? So it was just, it was, a, it was fantastic to see this spreading around the world. So I took this off of their website because I really like um, this. It's, there's actually a longer list, but I like these top three. Um, so the Tuscan museums, remember there's 60 plus museums just in Tuscany that are doing this. 
They want an active, intense, and meaningful encounter with the museum heritage. So it might be a museum of anthropology. It might be a museum of natural science. It might be a museum of art. But we want people to engage with that museum to promote activities dedicated to people with dementia and their caregivers. And then I love this last one, have no therapeutic intentions. We are not going to fix your dementia, right? This is not a magic pill, but we may give you joy. We may send you home feeling happy and that happiness lasts for a while. And that's a good thing. Okay, so I really like that, uh, the principles of the Tuscan museums. So, allow me to speak just for a few minutes about some research. Let me just check my time here. Okay, we're good. Um, okay, so uh, this is a study that was done in 2015. Um, and what they were trying to do was to figure out the impact of programs like SPARC and what they're doing in the Tuscan museums. So they had people at art galleries in the UK uh, and then they did interviews with people uh, afterwards about what this experience was like. I'm going to show you some quotes from these interviews in a minute, but first I want to show you this. They concluded, after they pulled together all the information that they got from the interviews, that there were three really important um, uh, results from participating in Spark-like programs. The museum itself became a valued place. It, it, it meant something. It wasn't just, you know, the building on the hill. It was a valued place. I'll tell you a story about that in a minute. It offered intellectual stimulation and, very importantly, social interaction. Remember? Loneliness, boredom, and helplessness. Okay? So, the museum as a valued place. It's valued for the people with dementia. It's valued for the care partners and for the volunteers and the wider community. It is so important that the Museum of Wisconsin Art puts, uh, uh, I'm a member so I get your beautiful, you know, publications, and, and it puts into that that you do spark because that educates the community, that tells the community oh, something interesting is going on here for people living with this thing that everybody's so scared about, right? Something really cool is happening. So it's important for the people living with dementia, for the care partners, and for the wider community, and, this, and including the volunteers. So about the valued place. Um, I, so I did this, I was, uh, Spark began in 2010. And I was asked to do the research to, because it was funded by a nice grant from the Bader Philanthropies. Uh, and um, they wanted to know, you know, is it doing anything? Is it any good? And so uh, we did research. We collected different kinds of data. We had questionnaires. And, and then I did interviews. And I will never forget doing an interview with a couple where the wife, the care partner of her husband, told me that she had lived in West Bend her entire life. Both of them had lived, they, you know, born and raised in West Bend. And this is when Mawa, is that how you say it? Moa, Mawa, anyway, this is when you were in the old house, okay? And she said, born and raised in West Bend and had never gone there, okay? But when Spark started, she took her husband there and, and, and it became a valued place. And what she did, this is so interesting, was that she, they would come for a Spark program and they'd sit in front of a painting or a piece of sculpture or something and 
they'd make up stories and, and do that. But then she would bring her husband back, you know, a couple of weeks later. Not for a SPARK program, but just because this place now is a valued place. I feel welcome here. And here she had been born and raised in West Bend and had never set foot in the place. So this is what these programs can do. So let me show you a couple of slides with quotes from people. And these are quotes from people living with some type of dementia. Friends, family are uncomfortable and say they don't know how to behave normally around me. They didn't really give our relationship a chance to move forward. This is, remember loneliness? This is one of the key things you find is that is that people don't know how to interact and they withdraw and people become more socially isolated. It's very interesting to see how people close to me act. It's, it's almost as if they're afraid of being, bringing up the subject. Being a cancer survivor, I know that I was constantly asked how I was doing while I was going through treatment. With Alzheimer's, no one asks. Okay. Um, I interviewed a woman one time a few years ago and, and uh, she had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's and had had to leave a wonderful job and, and she said to me, um, people wouldn't mind asking me about having the flu, but they don't want to ask me about the Alzheimer's. We're so afraid of this. SPARK programs and other programs can help us get over that. Here's another quote. They think I'm stupid and can't talk properly. So this is the, this is, uh, in, in um, psychology, we talk about excess disability, okay? So you have this disability because of the symptoms of the dementia, whatever type of dementia you have, and then you get excess disability because people don't know how to act around you. Does that make sense? It, it, it's like when somebody is in a wheelchair, okay, and, and you, we speak to them like this, okay, instead of getting down to speak to them. We create excess disability. And that happens to people who live with dementia. Treat us like normal people. We're still here, just a little slower and sometimes confused. Okay, a little bit more research. This is a messy slide, so I'm not going to read through it all, but it's demonstrating this is a whole bunch of studies that showed that participation in these museum programs reduces anxiety, increases well-being, uh, gives a sense of personal growth, develops a stronger sense of community, and it's a way to stay connected to the self and the wider community. So all good things, loneliness, boredom, helplessness, okay? Spark type programs are addressing that. Okay, so this is a, a big study that was done a couple, just a couple years ago. So this is one of these studies where they take a whole lot of other research and they put it all together, this was 145 other research programs, <clears throat> and, and, and try to kind of get a big picture view, okay? So they get all these other research programs and they mash them together and they try to get the big picture. And <clears throat> so they looked at music, theater, art appreciation, art making, etc., and they found significant improvements in general cognition, quality of life, you can see. Okay? Makes a difference. That's 145 studies that they mashed together and came up with that conclusion. So, I want to tell you just briefly about other types of community arts programs. Check my time. I'm okay. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> so, there are some SPARK programs that take SPARK on the road. And they take SPARK on the road to long-term care. Uh, and and um, this is so important.
So when I say long-term care, I mean what we tr traditionally think of as nursing homes, assisted living, memory care, you know, they're popping up everywhere, right? And, and uh, certainly it's just a small percentage of people with dementia who live in these places, but still we see them in our communities. But how often do we go into them? How often do we interact with people living there? So a couple of years ago, I got a grant to hire an artist in residence to go to our county nursing home up in Outagamie County. It's called Brewster Village. And this artist had never worked with people with dementia, but I did some teaching and we got some volunteers and we did this arts program in this county nursing home. Medicaid, residents, people living with dementia, and these are some of the things we did. So this is a drawing that one of the uh, residents made. And, and after she drew it, I asked her some time slips type questions to tell me a story about this. And so this is the story that we put together when I asked her, what do you want to call this guy? And who do you, th who do you think he is? And et cetera. Here's what she said. This is Henry the bookkeeper. He works in an office and he kind of needs a shave. His hair doesn't stay in place and has a little curl on top. He lives up north and he likes to fish and hunt rabbits and squirrels. He isn't married. Who'd want him? <laughs> okay, so these are responses to my question of, is he married? And she says, who'd want him? And, and my question, of, where do you think he lives? Oh, he lives up north. Well, what does he do up north? Well, he hunts. You get that idea. You do this in Spark. Okay, so that was one. Here's another one. So this is a woman who very carefully drew this picture, and it was supposed to be a self-portrait. And this woman died about a week after this program, and her family was so touched by having this drawing. And this is what she said about the drawing. She didn't have a lot of language, but this is what she said. A crazy day, a crazy hair day makes me happy. <laughs> you know, and I get happy every time I look at that and think about it. A crazy hair day makes me happy. Now this next picture is something that taught me a big lesson. So this was a woman who was wheeled into our weekly art program. And uh, she was kind of slumped in her chair. And her nose was kind of running. And we would put a pencil in her hand or a paintbrush, and nothing much would happen. And this went on week after week. And to be honest, I wasn't really sure if she could, you know, participate in the group. But then, then something amazing happened. And I think what was going on in those weeks when she was kind of out of it was that she was taking some kind of cold medicine, okay? I think it was pharmacological. And then she wasn't taking it anymore. And lo and behold, she paints this picture. And that made me feel humbled about my previous attitude about her. And it gave me tremendous joy to see that, that she was able to do that. And it gave her and her family joy too. And we took this, we used this picture as a, um, on a poster that we made and we had a community arts gathering and we made a gallery and et cetera, et cetera. But that taught me some humility. Now this picture comes from memory camp. Oh, go ahead. Um, way back in the day, uh, I used to take a lot of pills and I was so numb. And when I got off the pills, I would be able to talk more uh -huh. and understand other people yeah. more. Yeah, 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 yeah. We don't realize what that does to us. 
So this is a picture from memory camp. And this is a man who um, did not have much language, uh, and it's clearly pretty severe memory problems, but he spent at least an hour sitting at a picnic table at memory camp, arranging the stones and the sticks and the pine cones that he had collected. I mean, it, seriously, it looks like something that could be in this shop, right? It was so beautiful. Uh, and his wife was so amazed to see him doing this and to see him so focused on this for such a long time. It was bringing out something in him uh, and, and it made something beautiful. And I just have always loved that picture from Memory Camp from a few years ago. So other community arts programs. This is our chorus that we have up in Appleton. It's called On a Positive Note. I don't know whether you can see the t-shirts that we have. We now have vests that say on a positive note. We just practiced yesterday. We practice once a week. Um, we will be performing this Sunday at a memory care uh, residence in Appleton. Um, and um, <laughs> we're singing Frankie Valley songs. <laughs> and a lot, you'd be surprised at what we sing. Uh, but we have a fabulous time together, uh, and it's another way of doing community arts programming. There are three of these choruses, at least in Wisconsin. There's the Amazing Grace Chorus that's down in Milwaukee, and there's another chorus over in the Eau Claire area. <coughs> so uh, think about starting a chorus. It's tremendous fun. Time slips. I've mentioned time slips a couple of times. Uh, <laughs> yes, a couple of times I've mentioned time slips. Uh, uh, this is a uh, creative storytelling method that has uh, spread worldwide. It was begun by Ann Basting, who uh, teaches at University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Uh, she is internationally known. Uh, and uh, she began the Time Slips program over 20 years ago, and it has just evolved into something quite amazing. So if you're not familiar with it, go online, check it out, um, because it's a way of engaging creativity. There's a cool little uh, animated video on the, on the first, on the homepage that, uh, you should check out. So, top, creativity opens late life to growth, meaning, and joy. So there's all kinds of programs now uh, for time slips. And, and that's what's been adapted for a lot of this spark programming that we do. Oops. Now here's another one that's kind of fun. Uh, this is a program that is based over in uh, Minnesota out of uh, uh, Minneapolis, uh, the Kairos Clubhouse, but <clears throat> it's online and it's dance. And um, so I took, a, and you can kind of see me, let's see if I can point it out. Uh, the pointer's not really working. I'm in the second from the left on the top taking a picture of my screen. So I'm at home in my home office in front of my computer. There are people at adult day centers all over Minnesota and in Wisconsin, and there are individuals. Um, uh, we had a wonderful mother-daughter uh, couple. Um, uh, mom had a pretty severe dementia, but every week they danced with us. So you can dance by yourself, you can dance with a care partner, you can dance with a group. Um, uh, 10.30 on Thursday mornings. Um, so I'm in my office jumping around. <laughs> but you can, you, you can dance with your finger, right? You don't have to stand up. You can, it, but it's a way of connecting with people. And, and the folks who run this program call out and they'll say, hey, Susan, you know, or hey, how about the group up in Bemidji, <laughs> Minnesota? or wherever they are. 
so this is the uh, Hyros Clubhouse. So here's another long quote. And this is a quote to have us thinking about where we're going next. This is a quote from 1985. The arts can play a healing role, and it is not too far-fetched to suggest that the medical prescription of the future may not be limited to pills and dosages, but may direct the client toward aesthetic enjoyment or appreciation. That work, Hal, thank you, okay? So this is from 1985. It, it's really prescient. It's, uh, in, in fact, uh, it, it just, okay, so the arts might not, I mean, uh, it, it can play a healing role. It, it might not be too far-fetched to think your doctor might give you a prescription to attend a SPARK program. And in fact, that is happening all over England. It's called social prescribing, and it is coming to the United States. And there is an organization in the United States, socialprescribingusa.com, you can go to the website and check it out, that is trying to get this embedded into healthcare systems because pills are not going to be the whole answer. You know, we've got the Surgeon General of the United States all over radio today talking about loneliness, right? Do, do we give a pill for loneliness? Do we give a pill for boredom? Do we give a pill for helplessness? No. So social prescribing is coming. And social prescribing for community, gathering together, Social prescribing for getting out in nature. We have memory cafes at nature centers, okay? Um, um, all over Wisconsin, we have memory cafes happening in nature centers. So social prescribing for nature. Take a walk, go to the park. Social prescribing for volunteering. Remember I said, you know, helplessness to serve others as well as yourself. And finally, social prescribing for the arts, all right? So this is all from this website, Social Prescribing USA. It's starting to happen, okay? It's starting to get into healthcare systems. I was just talking with the network person um, uh, before we started about how network is, has talked to me about memory cafes, okay? What if your doctor, you know, says, okay, here's a prescription for Aricept and Amenda, and oh, by the way, you want to go to a memory cafe, okay? Or a Spark program. All right, so I am to the end of my time here, and this is my last slide. To celebrate the Museum of Wisconsin Art, that you have the Art Plus Wellness Program, which we're doing here today, and you have spark, and that's fabulous. Thank you so much.